Hello, everyone. I really hope that I am live now and you can uh, see me. Um, my name is Aster Nummelin Karlberg, and I'm Open Forum Europe's policy director. Uh, Open Forum Europe, or OFE, is a Brussels-based think tank yeah, working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. So welcome today's event, uh, to today's event on open source program offices in government and academia. Um, this event uh, is the second installment of uh, the OFE open source policy series that we're doing uh, now this year, 2021. And our goal is to offer some deep dives into the most relevant topics in the area of open source, open technologies in general, uh, and how they intersect, of course, with the most pressing digital policy challenges facing Europe. So I'd like to, first of all, thank our series partner, the Eclipse Foundation, and our event sponsor, GitHub, for helping us make this event and this series happen at this very exciting time for open technologies and public policy. So uh, this uh, public uh, policy series uh, follows OFE's uh, EU Open Source Policy Summit, which took place in February, where high-level policymakers such as European Commissioner Thierry Breton set the scene for what is at stake. Um, so, you know, following that, we will host now six virtual events uh, during the spring and early summer. So, and we'll address the role of open in, in several crucial policy areas, such as the European chip industry, the green transition, institutional capacity building, which is this event is very much on, digital sovereignty, 5G, and the EU's competitiveness. And of course, uh, we hope to see you at several, if not all of these events. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so if you want to ask a question, please write it in the chat and the OFE team will do its best to bring it to the attention of the moderator if it's time and if it fits into the program. But we encourage you definitely to, to you know, use the chat actively. And like with all uh, our activities, this exchange is covered by OFE's community participation guidelines, um, which have been posted in the chat just now, I think. Um, you can also find them on our website. But it's nothing super tricky. Just be your most friendly self. Um, and so today, we'll hear from several interesting speakers who are working with this topic, which, uh, in our view, is right at the cutting edge of uh, public open source policy uh, or public sector open source. Um, I will, however, begin with a short presentation, uh, which I hope can frame this uh, this this panel um, from OFE's point of view, um, because we have a series of quite detailed policy recommendations regarding OSPOS as a tool for European institutional capacity building. Um, after my presentation, we'll show a video recording with Eric Botterell, member of the French National Assembly, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, but. Um, uh, took the time to record a, a shorter interview with me. Um, uh, and this, in this, we're discussing uh, his recommendation in his report for an OSPO for the fresh French National Administration. And then I'll hand over to our moderator and panelists for a discussion uh, on the case for OSPOs in government and academia. So now, since, as you heard, there's both a video and I will share some slides. Uh, fingers crossed, everyone, that we will manage to uh, get all this sharing seamlessly onto your screens as well. Let's see here. Can everybody see this presentation? If so, write it in the chat. OK, good. Um, let's see. Yes, time for some slides. I'll keep it very brief, however. Um, yes, so the recommendation I'm presenti presenting here today uh, comes in the context of a European Commission study uh, that was uh, uh, has been conducted by us at OFE together with Fraunhofer ISI on the impact of open source software and hardware and technological independence and competitiveness and innovation. Um, this is, we've presented the final results at the summit in February, and it will be officially published in the coming weeks and months. There's a little bit of internal commission process that we can't, unfortunately, give you too much information on right now, but um, in the near future, this uh, will finally be published. So, um, I will uh, really run through the, you know, the study is almost uh, 
400 pages. So it, it's not really doing it justice to present um, the, the bulk of it in this one slide. But just to, to give you a sense of uh, the numbers we're talking here, we've estimated that the impact of uh, open source software on the EU economy is between 65 and 95 billion euros uh, based on uh, 2018 figures. This should be said, of course, it's a very conservative estimate but, uh, because it's it's a difficult task to, to estimate this economic impact. But regardless, uh, 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 what we can show is that, which I think most people here uh, could expect, uh, the role of open source in the European economy is uh, substantial. And just to put this into context with a bit of more of a dynamic number, uh, we've calculated that an increase of code contributions of 10% would generate an additional uh, 100 billion uh, euros in EU GDP per year, and an additional uh, 1,000 ICT startups per year. So um, over to the OSPO. Um, why did we look into this for our policy recommendations? Well, one of the main reasons is that the OSPO has been a cornerstone in realizing vast amount of value from open source for the private sector. Um, uh, let's say uh, many shareholders have been uh, duly awarded for uh, for work companies have done uh, in open source. Um, and as a result, um, uh, uh, we believe that the OSPO as an organizational con construct has the potential to realize vast amount of value from open source for citizens across Europe and the world. And I really mean vast. Uh, I, we're looking at uh, Vast, yeah, very large amounts of, of untapped uh, potential here. But so, uh, yeah, okay, OSPO, Open Source Program Office. Um, uh, what is this? Uh, what are we talking about? Um, well, the OSPO uh, is an organizational construct within an organization or a company, or as we talk about here, uh, uh, government administration, any public administration really, or university that supports and accelerates the consumption, creation, and application of open technologies. So a large number of companies have adopted the OSPO as best practice for internal open source management. And um, very inter interestingly, they have over time started sharing best practices uh, through, through semi-formal networks where the OSPOs work uh, with each other. Um, as such, uh, of course, there is the developer. There are many different fundamental building blocks. But from a kind of organizational structure point of view, um, uh, we see that the OSPO is this fundamental building block and the networking interface and the global institutional infrastructure of open source. So that's a long term, but uh, think about just all the different stakeholders that exist out there, be it companies, uh, governments, uh, individual developers, um, uh, projects and, and uh, open source foundations. And um, the OSPO is a very interesting, yeah, kind of yeah, interface, uh, a m middleware that connects all these things together. Um, and one point here is in our research and in, in, uh, you know, from other people's research as well, we've seen that a company OSPO that networks with other OSPOs at other companies is a clear sign of the maturity of, of that OSPO. At early stages, it might be more inward uh, focused and look to things like uh, legal compliance, et cetera. Um, but this kind of active and OSPO as a, um, a construct that does things actively in a network is definitely a sign of maturity. So as such, we believe that this uh, 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 the OSPO should be considered as central to um, uh, European open source capacity building. And this is uh, uh, goes beyond the private sector. Where we've already seen a lot of uptake and, and extends into public sector and academia, where there are already uh, more OSPOs being formed. Um, but we think that this is an area, as I said, where there's a lot of untapped potential. Uh, so following this this reasoning, um, we recommended the European Commission um, um, uh, the following. Um, and the first thing is that we we um, uh, recommend the European Commission OSPO, which has already been established, I think, in November last year, um, to to um, uh, give it a, uh, an external networking component. Um, this would mean to um, uh, actively use the EC OSPO 
as the Commission's external collaboration interface to different OSPOs, OSPO enabled institutions within industry, research organizations, universities, and within Europe, but you know, across borders, really where the European Commission mandate is in place. Um, and this again has to uh, to do with um, uh, realizing the vast value of open source ecosystems for European citizens. And we think that this holistic vision of the internal and external work is a very necessary starting point. And then um, the second generation we, or recommendation uh, was to make the uh, European Commission OSPO into uh, a sort of legislative coordinator for everything touching open technologies within the Commission. Um, um, with the European, uh, with the OSPO, they're building, you know, building on already existing uh, open source competence. Um, but we think that this can be further le leveraged internally to act as kind of a consulting body for for cabinets, um, for direct other uh, director gen uh, directorates general, uh, and units drafting policy that touches open source and open technologies in general. Because we've seen uh, uh, open source and open technologies having been subject of unintended consequences of EU policy in the past, um, and very much pointing to the word unintended here, um, and making sure that uh, uh, open source experts take a look at policy uh, is going to be very important moving forward as kind of a defensive move. Um, then we asked the Commission to uh, to do, you know, a mapping of European, I suppose, already existence in industry, public sector, and academia. Of course, it's always a good first step to just take a look at where we're at, um, and this uh, can kind of form the basis for for best practices around OSPOs and be the kind of nascent network to build then in the future a stronger European OSPO network. Then, uh, thirdly or fourthly. Um, we encourage the European Commission to um, build 20 OSPOs, so 10 in the public sector and 10 in the academic sector through uh, their funding programs. Because in industry, there's already a steady increase in the number of OSPOs, as I mentioned. And this increase can and should be encouraged. But um, you know, for the sake of this event, uh, let's focus on public sector and academia. And um, for the public sector, we recommend the Commission to, to use its funding programs, such as Horizon Europe and Digital Europe, to fund and support the formation of at least 10 OSPOs in European government institutions to kind of speed up the process of developing best practices for government when it comes to open source. Um, we also believe that it's important that in this funding uh, uh, of these pilot OSPOs to, to requiring the OSPOs to have this network component that I talked about. Um, the idea there is to kind of leapfrog the maturity of, of uh, uh, European government OSPOs, um, uh, you know, to not just start on internal compliance, but already from the start um, add this networking capability. And for academia, we recommend a similar approach as for the public sector with 10 pilot OSPOs. But um, then, of course, here taking the particular needs and demands of public research institutions and universities into consideration. Um, and it should be stated here that for both the public sector and academia, we recommend considering the requirements of the OSPO being built with care um, and not just necessarily importing directly uh, experiences and constructs from the private sector. Um, because on the one hand, uh, uh, these OSPOs need to be flexible enough to meet the very diverse open source goals uh, of different organizations, and depending on you know not just local, regional, and national, but also in different countries, etc. While on the other hand, they also have to maintain kind of a, a network component that is you know standardized with you know a, a small s, uh, standardized enough to to uh, enhance organizational interoperability, which is at heart what it is that we, we really want to go for here. And then finally, uh, we recommend that the European Commission creates uh, a program meant to network the European Commission OSPO, of course, the identified OSPOs in the industry and public sector and academia already in place, as well as the OSPOs formed uh, with support from the EU funding programs in the public sector and academia. Um, you know, uh, of course, then in the future, perhaps specific subgroups where the different sectors can be considered. But for this first step network, um, uh, uh, we believe that the European Commission should also consider funding um, 
an organization that takes care of this uh, um, uh, network as a backbone institutional infrastructure to achieve open source policy at scale. Because scale is really the point we're talking about here from a European Commission point of view. It's at a European scale where, um, let's say, the policy goals might differ a little bit from what you would articulate at a regional or a national level. So. Um, as a final point here, and uh, something that I, you know, the ones who talk OSPOS with me for <laughs> know that I go on about, um, uh, we recommend mainstreaming the term OSPO for reasons of semantic interoperability between diverse uh, institutions. Um, a network of OSPOs that kind of speak the same language and you have other OSPOs or developers or companies looking at a government institution or a university wondering how to engage in the area of open source with them. Um, the OSPO is a natural place to start. It's already an established term. Um, and if you have these OSPOs that um, have similar organizational structure, even though they might have different goals, um, um, and have similar, uh, relatively similar competences within them and mandates. Um, the more similar they are, like with any kind of interoperability, uh, the easier we can enable structured collaboration between not just the European Commission OSPO, but you know, OSPOs within government organizations, research organizations, universities, open source foundations, private sector OSPOs, um, and you know, everybody else in the vast uh, global open source ecosystem. So both in Europe and beyond. So I hope I didn't speak too fast, uh, but I kind of rushed through this. Um, let's see if I managed to stop the slides. Yes, that worked. Um, I hope that was relatively clear as a framing. And now I'll do the trickiest part, which is um, moving over to the video with um, uh, Mr. Botterell. Please give me a few seconds to get this to work. So we at Open Forum Europe are very happy to have Mr. Eric, uh, Eric Botorel with us here today. Mr. Botterell is a member of parliament for uh, La République en Marche uh, in the uh, French um, uh, Assembly. Last year, he was tasked with investigating French data policies by the pr uh, prime minister, which resulted in a recently uh, published report. We have asked him to join us today in order to comment on the report generally, which has several interesting analyses and recommendations. But more specifically, uh, we will look to the recommendation that the public authorities um, are to create an open source program office. Uh, Mr. Botterell, welcome very much. Thank you. So Maybe. I'll get, yeah, I'll get straight to it. Uh, could you give us a brief explanation, first of all, uh, of the prime minister's mission that led to your report? What were the political concerns that you addressed? And of course, uh, how is this connected to, to open data and open source in addressing those concerns? Yeah, thank you for the, your question. Uh, let me go back to the beginning of the game of this, uh, of this mission. The prime minister asked me in June 2020 uh, to work on open data and open source, which meant uh, assessing a current policy framework and come up with appropriate recommendation in order to improve France's strategy and global position on these topics. The particularity of missions mandated by the PM is that I was detached from my duties as MP for six months and was offered the possibility to rely on executive resources. So I had the chance to work with a dozen of high civil servants coming from different ministries, um, and uh, which allowed us to have a very large scope uh, on conduct of thorough of objective analysis of the situation. I could also count on the insight of Renaud Vedel, our coordinator for France AI strategy, and Stephanie Kahn, the head of the French Earth Data Hub. In total, we conducted more than 220 hearings, interviewed people from all backgrounds and sectorial fields, launching a consultation platform to gather citizens' opinion and write a policy review with 38 recommendations that was handed to the PM at the late December. I think we got a into details for the, the, the 38 recommendations. Since then, 
several of our recommendations have already been implemented on the opening of certain data sets on source code or on data governance of the administration. We had several political concerns in mind during this period. As the COVID-19 crisis demonstrated, we need to rely more and more on data to take informed decisions. So that means fostering data sharing and circulation, both within the public sector and between public and private bodies. Indeed, we realized at some point that we were lacking crucial information, for example, concerning drugs, supplies, or patients' allocation within our healthcare system that would have allowed us to manage the crisis more efficiently. We already have a clear legal framework, the Digital Republic Law, uh, we talk this uh, later, I think, that requires public administration to open their data and source codes by default and for free, which should stimulate innovation and consolidate France's position as a leading knowledge economy. However, this framework is still partially implemented, be it because of a lack of data culture among spatial and governance inefficiencies. At the same time, we were confronted to the question of the transition of certain data producers within the administration, Meteo France, IGN, to a model based fully on open data, whereas they were previously drawing revenues data monetization. We also had to address the specific case of open source within research and the education, which already benefited from a dedicated study by Etalab. Overall, our mission aimed in analyzing strategic and financial opportunities that we should size by accelerating open data and open source by default within the administration and certain part of the economy. We tried, we make our best, and we try to be as concrete as possible and mainly based our work on many use cases from which we draw more general principles and policy recommendations. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Botterell. Um, yeah, generally, I would like to uh, uh, take this opportunity also to guide the uh, uh, audience attention to this report. That there's a summary in English. It's very valuable to read, and we will focus on the uh, OSPOs here. Uh, but there are many other very interesting uh, uh, recommendations as well. And so, uh, for the sake uh, of the topic of this event. Um, uh, we have seen at Open Forum Europe an increasing attention on the creation of open source program offices in government administrations as a tool to achieve policy goals. And we've seen you know, the best example, perhaps most known, is the European Commission has announced the, uh, or has uh, created theirs. So, so Mr. Botterell, would you please elaborate on the reasons behind uh, yeah, recommendation eight for those interested uh, calling for a French national OSPO? Yeah, one of uh, the reasons behind the recommendation to create the French National OSPO is that we made the observation that our public sector or open source community, community sorry, wasn't structured and uh, supported enough. Open source is an interesting means to share knowledge and materialize working tools so that we can avoid the situation where two offices are spending resources on the same problem within talking to each other and helping each other out. So the OSPO is a necessary first step towards more structural and visible open source initiatives in the administration. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, so in this context, then um, 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 the OSPO creation, uh, we're looking to potentially seeing one in the in the uh, French administrations. But so, what would you say are the um, open source policy goals of the French administration? And how do you see the OSPO as a potential tool to achieve these uh, uh, goals? Well, to, um, to, to, be, to be honest, after what I said previously, uh, well, if I want to complete my, uh, my, my talking, besides we also have the strength in positive feedback groups as the better we know how to manage open source projects that are made, in the public sector, and the better should the public sector know how to buy, implement, and use open source for software. It should also help to administration and civil servants to gain further skills on this subject that is essential for digital sovereignty, as we today are quite dependent on property solutions. That's why it's quite interesting to create a specific body that will have the responsibility to support the opening of source codes 
and their rules within the, within the administration, as well as deepening the relations with existing open source communities and support French developers in this domain. Okay, part, yeah, and that's very interesting because from our point of view at OFE, it's also uh, the discussion around um, the OSPO and open source policies in general, they're broad. It's everything from, of course, the procurement of services and products for the needs of the administration, but also these more societal aspects of digital skills, uh, the question of digital autonomy or sovereignty. Um, yeah, that, that that's very, very interesting to hear. Um, so uh, now, of course, bringing it a little bit to the attention to Open Forum Europe, we've also uh, um, produced a report, not uh, not yet uh, published, but relatively soon. And um, uh, uh, as uh, I've presented earlier, um, we have uh, in our study or our report put forward a policy recommendation um, that the European Commission should start a pilot project um, uh, funding the setting up of 20 OSPOs across Europe, both in public sector and in academia. So uh, how would you see the French national uh, uh, OSPO in this European context? First of all, we have to make sure that this OSPO will be created. And after that, uh, I'm, I'm sure that because we have um, uh, a habit now uh, to work together across Europe, um, we should have something that uh, could coordinate all the OSPO uh, organizations. So I'm very confident with the fact that uh, um, as soon as uh, each country or several countries uh, will build this OSPO initiative, there we can communicate uh, uh, across Europe. You know, uh, well, one thing it's, is important is I don't want to close uh, to, to have a match only uh, between um, the closing or the opening of the data. Uh, what is very important is about the circulation, the free flow of data, for instance, it is very famous for Europe now. Um, uh, and um, we, are to, we are to do our best to make sure that uh, each initiative is in, in each country, even if it's not really the same uh, or with, with the same parameters, uh, because of the particularity of, of each country. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, we work together and uh, there are some kind of coordination between all the OSPO uh, on each country. That, that's the third way of Europe around the digital issue uh, or topics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, of course, uh, it, Europe needs to work together to achieve scale, the scale needed to be able to solve the many big challenges in the digital policy field that are facing us, of course. Yeah. But so taking it back a little bit to France, uh, and I think uh, probably many of our uh, French participants are just interested in the, this uh, report in the context of broader efforts. Uh, do you think that the creation of, of uh, the free software mission or, or, or uh, the OSPO uh, uh, following your report will be able to contribute to the implementation of Article 16 of the Digital Republic Law, which provides uh, that the state services encourages the use of uh, free software and open formats during the development purchase uh, uh, or use of um, uh, all or part of their information systems? The answer is yes, really yes. Uh, I already touched upon part of the question in my previous answer when I mentioned positive feedback loops. Basically, the OSPO will be a, a way to make it the public open source software more visible and help convincing civil servants that in, than the yeah, information system can benefit from open source software. I can also mention a, a project called Label that aims at labeling the best digital solution, most proprietary and open source, which is specific and visible open source criteria. The administration asks for open source, so this will necessarily benefit public procurement. On the other side, you have a project named SEAL, which is a global reference catalog for administration. It will continue on giving more visibility to specific open so software that more organizations will want to implement. So it will also benefit local businesses that develop open source solutions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Botterell. Uh, we congratulate you on your report. And, uh, and of course, we will look with a lot of attention and interest in the, uh, you know, for, for uh, future developments in. Uh, in France and um, 
uh, yeah, with that, I would say uh, give the word back to our moderator, Claire Dillon. Thank you very much, Ms. Botorel. Have a good day. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So almost made that very good and smooth uh, because I handed back the, the work to me uh, myself. As you uh, perhaps could see, I tried to wear some similar uh, outfits to make the video blend in more seamlessly. But anyhow, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Claire Dillon. Um, Claire has spent over 20 years working with developers and developer communities. She works with Moss Labs to support the establishment of uh, university and government open source program offices and uh, the OSPO++ movement globally. She has recently been instrumental in setting up Ireland's first network for those interested in advancing open source at national level. Claire, now I think everyone has seen enough of me, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Aster, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me along. Um, and at this point, I would like to invite uh, the, the participants in our very first panel here today. Um, so I would like to invite on Neja and Saeed and Roberto, if you would like to join me on screen. What we'll do as you're joining is that I will just give a brief introduction for our panelists. And uh, hopefully by the time I finish, they'll be on. Here's Roberto. Hello, Roberto. Um, you, you can, as you come on, please do feel free to wave as I mention your name. And uh, we're just waiting on Neja. Hopefully she will be arriving any minute now. But let's start anyway with, with who we have here. So Roberto uh, de Cosmo is a professor in computer science in the University of Paris Diderot. Um, but he more recently, he has been leading the Software Heritage Project, which is doing amazing work in collecting, preserving, and sharing all the software that's available in source code. So welcome, Roberto. Um, you're based Thanks, in France, yeah. and I know you have a lot to, to share with us on, on the French national strategy. Um, I'd also like to welcome Saeed Chowdhury, uh, who's the Associate Dean for Research Management at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in the US. Uh, Saeed has set up the Johns Hopkins University Open Source Program Office, but also the new Institute for Applied Open Source. So I know you've got lots of great tips to share with us. So welcome, Saeed. Thank you. And, and Neja Lanour, uh, who is the CIO of the City of Paris. Uh, lovely to have you here, uh, Neja. Uh, she has been leading the digital transformation of the City of Paris, has been an open source enthusiast and advocate for many years, um, and specifically in terms of how open source can improve public services. So welcome to all of you. And let's get started. Um, perhaps, Roberto, we might start with you. Uh, we have just heard from Monsieur Botterell about how France is planning to build an open source program office at a national level. And you've been very, very active in that open source and open access scene for, for a long time, both internationally and specifically in France. So can perhaps you share your own observations and uh, how you think this OSPO will help France's national digital strategy? Well, okay, thanks a lot, Claire, to, to let me start this round. I would like to start to, pro to provide you a little bit, uh, to, to provide our audience a little bit of understanding on why this report is important now, how it changes something that happens in France. Let me give you a very brief but quick important recall of the evolution of system in France. You know, in, uh, uh, France has been at the leading edge in, in uh, deploying and using uh, open source, in particular in the public sector. Unfortunately, this is not very well known outside of France. You know, here in France, we like to write and speak, speak in French, and not everybody does it. And, not, and so we, we are not necessarily advertising things as well as we should do. But let me start 20 years ago. So in 2003, 2004, there was a groundbreaking project in the Ministry of Finance, recalling the full system, the IT system in there. That project was incredible, and it would opened up the market for open source in France. Uh, it would require a full talk to, 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 to explain why it worked, and I will be delighted to give another time. But just a starting point. You see, 2003, 2004, and that comes from the state. Okay, it's not a private company, it's a decision of the state that changes the market and opens up the market for open source. Then later on, 2007, uh, here in France again, was created a, a working group uh, uh, inside the competitiveness cluster, which, we, which was called Systematic, had been leading that for 10 years, and this created something like 50 plus research and development project, over 200 million euros invested to create real products that actually gain market you using only open source. And again, the public sector was key to achieve this kind of result. Then in 2012, you have a very important document, which is the circular IRO. It is a, it, the prime minister at the moment. 
this circular, uh, the circular, I don't know in English how you call it, but I mean, it's not a law, it's not a decree, it's a document that the Prime Minister sends around to tell people how they should work. And it provides incredible amount of uh, details on the good practices for using and contributing to open source community when you are in the public sector. I will not talk about the city of Paris because I'm sure that Naja will do it, but we, we need to have a hat tip to the city of Paris, which did an incredible job with Lutez. You will hear more from Jatel. And then you see, I mean, this was a lot of time ago. Then you have these papers. I mean, there was a study by Georgia Tech placing France as a top-notch place, the best favorable place for, soft, uh, for open source development. A study by Frank Nagel, 2019, on the impact of this uh, uh, circular error, how much it impacted the, the problem here. And then there was a creation of open source working group in the National Committee of Open Science, them leading since 2018, then Sartorius started here. So you say, hey, if you are so advanced, why do you need an OSPO? So let me answer this question, okay? Yes, in one sense, we have been extremely advanced compared to other places in the world. And uh, look, this is not chauvinism. I would be delighted that we were the last in line. Okay, and to fight a lot of our people much more advanced than us, because you don't want to be alone, right? You want to more to have more friends on the table. But if you look at what happened, many, many times this kind of advances came out of individual decisions by heroes that actually managed to, to carry the message at the right moment with the incredible effort made into making this real. What we hope to see as a change through this. OSPO is to actually institutionalize this kind of operations to make sure that it is no longer on the shoulder of some heroes, lady or men, to, to actually carry this over, but there is a clear place in the organization, in the public sector in particular, we are talking about public sector here, right? In the public sector, a place where this mission is clearly written, carved in stone, and that takes care of ensuring reliability, trust, coherence, cons uh, cons uh, I, mean, uh, I would say, I, I'm missing the English word here, I mean, consistency, consistency of the position and of the operations. So you want to have a phone number, you call that phone number, and you understand what is the strategy, what is the position, and this will not change in one year or in two years, because a person changes, he stays relatively consistent, like we see in many other operations here in the state. So the Botrell report was not, I mean, uh, 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 the deputy Botrell made it very clear, 90% of the report is on open data, not on open source. But it was a very important vehicle to carry the vision that we need, a mission logistic libre or an OSPO, if you want in English, to actually ensure there is consistency and that we leverage all this experience we already had, making also available, share it with the rest of Europe, the rest of the world. Uh, in, uh, and you have a phone number to call it. I remember, you remember Kennedy saying, hey, Europe doesn't exist when I want to call the Europe, what is a phone number? Well, it's the same situation here when you're talking about open source strategy. What is a phone number? I need to dial to talk to the person that gives me an insight on the strategy and that I can trust. I mean, tomorrow, the answer will be the same. So I'm oh. sorry, I was a little bit long, no. but I, I hope to share some. I think that's some... wonderful. It's, and, it, and it's brilliant to get the, the context of how this has evolved in France, um, because many of our examples here today of, of, of people who have been involved in this efforts to date have come from, from your area. And in fact, to your note about the fact that we have some heroes who've done extraordinary things, let me go to one of the superheroes here, Neja, for, from the city of Paris, who has um, had some great impact with open source for Paris, again, over a long period of time. Neja, perhaps you can talk a little bit more specifically specifically about how you have uh, leveraged open source in the city of Paris. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the Open Forum Europe for inviting me today with Philippe. We are always very happy to tell about open source our open source experience and uh, learn from others as well. So uh, at the city of Paris, we run a powerful city services engine called LUTES, maybe you know it, uh, that we have developed in-house for uh, 20 years now. 
the first project was designed as a content management system. Uh, it was made to administrate the websites of the 20 districts or town halls uh, for non-technical agents. And uh, right after it came out, the Council of Paris voted to uh, open source its code. It was our first uh, project. They believed that the public money should benefit other municipalities or administrations. It was a very uh, strong uh, political will and therefore uh, citizens would only pay once for the public code. So it was the beginning of the story. Uh, then over the years, the platform, uh, as new needs came out, uh, the, we were helped by contractors and uh, our internal team was uh, also uh, involved in the development of Lutest. We could implement a uh, new uh, standard and reusable, reusable uh, features and maintain the solutions uh, to the state of, uh, of art. And now it runs uh, most of our digital services, maybe 80% uh, uh, of the digital services and 60% of our uh, applications. So now Lutes uh, offers more than 20, uh, 200 digital services on shelf, more than uh, 4.6 million lines of code, and it can be used to generate multi-step forms uh, based on a powerful workflow engine. Uh, it, has, it offers also uh, an appointment booking system, a 311 type of application, uh, to report non-emergency incidents in the public space. It's called uh, Dans ma rue or In my street. Uh, we, can we can run also our participatory budgeting budget every year with uh, LUTES. Uh, we built a citizen relationship management and all these modules are based on standard and are a real, uh, and uh, reusable plugins which make a solid and reliable software for a municipality. Uh, it can be reused for, by other municipalities and um, we are discussing with uh, French and um, uh, European municipalities to share it. Oh, thank you, Neja. And um, I think, you know, back to what Roberto was saying, um, in, in the case of the city of Paris, uh, you have done an amazing job at actually sharing what has been happening there and actually collaborating with others, not only in France, but actually abroad um, as well. And I think, Saeed, you have been collaborating with the city of Paris from Baltimore um, in the context of Johns Hopkins OSPO. So perhaps you can talk to us specifically about how the OSPO was involved in the the collaboration between Baltimore and the city of Paris around LUTES? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you, Claire. So uh, I, I, as Claire mentions, I lead the OSPO at Johns Hopkins University and have been working with colleagues in the city of Paris. We've also been working with a local community center in West Baltimore called the St. Francis Neighborhood Center. Uh, one of the ways in which people engage with their cities uh, is through these community centers. So clearly there's, uh, of course, value having the municipality itself, the elected officials involved in this way. But another way is to have these trusted other kinds of entities, uh, community centers, religious institutions, and, and the like, uh, involved in engaging citizens directly. So how was the OSPA involved? I mean, in a, in a very basic and fundamental way, we couldn't have done this without working with the OSPO. Uh, and what do I mean by that is, if you think about the city of Paris, Johns Hopkins University based in Baltimore, Maryland, and a community center based in West Baltimore, the only two ways universities typically have to work with others is through grants and legal agreements. Uh, and both of them require considerable levels of effort, uh, particularly the legal agreement part, particularly if you're dealing with across countries. <laughs> So uh, I would submit that if we had put our energy and effort towards either coming up with a grant or a set of legal agreements, we would still be struggling with trying to sign those agreements and work together. Instead, we were able to use the open source license, the OSPO here, and what I would call the beginnings uh, of the OSPO in Paris, and in essence say, that's the framework under which we will operate. 
and, and let's just start operating. So it was a much faster way of actually doing the work. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. I think if any of the uh, participants who work at universities, when I say, think about the level of effort you would have got to go through to sign formal agreements versus dedicating that effort to actually working together. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful rebalancing of effort. The other way that's been very important is, Claire, you alluded to this Institute for Applied Open Source that we've launched uh, at Hopkins as well, which is really taking the work of the OSPO and moving it into other aspects of the university's mission, such as the education aspects. So there were uh, a few students who worked a couple of years ago on the Lutest platform through one of the courses in computer science. And we've actually hired a student that we identified uh, through one of our hackathons to continue working on it. And I'm glad to say that the OSPO is the mechanism through which these students are getting formal recognition and acknowledgement. So students do a lot of work outside of their courses, uh, a lot of work outside of the tangible types of outputs they produce. So now you have an opportunity to say, I worked on this open source project and here's this, my university's OSPO formalizing that, recognizing that and helping me convey that to the rest of the world in terms of whether I'm looking for a job or applying to graduate school and so on. And this has evolved in a really wonderful way into something we're calling semesters of code. So through a partnership with the Department of Computer Science uh, and with uh, key individuals at Microsoft, we're going to have semester long experiences starting in fall of 2021, working on open source projects like the tests. So what we hear from our students is we want practical experience. And what we hear from employers is we want students to have practical experience. And what we hear from the community centers is we love the energy and enthusiasm of, uh, enthusiasm of the students, but how do we sustain that beyond a weekend event like a hackathon? And Semesters of Code is this wonderful convergence where it's all coming together as part of their academic experience. They register like it is a course, but they actually work with real platforms like Lutas. They actually work with not only the people who develop the platforms, but the people who use the platforms. So understanding that you don't develop open source software in a vacuum, the key aspect is not only the community of developers, but also the community of users. So a much more holistic kind of experience. And I'll just end with one point that the current student we're working with. Every semester I ask her, would you like to keep working on this project? And every semester she says the same thing, which is I'm getting more out of this than I am some of my courses. So yes, I kind of want to keep working on this. And we just like to scale that in a more formal way through semesters of code. Uh, thank you, Saeed. And I, I think it, I think it's marvelous to think about the OSPO giving that recognition and also uh, supporting the overall open source community by actually helping people get on board and on board and obviously uh, perhaps even change the future of education to include open source. It's a great point as well. But it was interesting as well to hear how your uh, focus on what Aster was mentioning earlier, that the that be able to have a kind of a standard um, uh, consistent way to actually deal across borders, in fact, across oceans, <laughs> uh, is, it has been so important in that respect. And Neja, if I can come back to you for a minute, because as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, when you started this journey, you didn't have a formal open source program office, but in many respects, you were performing many of the functions that Roberto and Aster and Saeed have also talked about in terms of helping these collaborations and helping internally how you produce, you know, creating guidelines around how you produce software. So can you perhaps, uh, but I know, I know now you are thinking at a city of Paris level to actually create a formal OSPO. Can you maybe elaborate on how you think that would benefit Paris? You're right. Uh, even without an official OSPO, City of Paris has been involved uh, in open source since 2001 now. Uh, by uh, contributing, using or using open source software. Uh, we have Lutest, but we have also uh, other open source software. We share, for example, with Geneva for Botalista soft, uh, application or for digital uh, uh, open digital classrooms with uh, maybe 10 or 12 other local authorities. So we have an important experience on um, uh, open source software and sharing uh, our application with other administrations. Uh, of course, uh, this period is very difficult with the pandemic um, and a new mandate which is beginning. And But we are uh, thinking about it uh, because it could, um, uh, it could help us to share more 
Uh, we know that many private companies have their own OSPO. Uh, it's not the same case in the public sector. I think it's uh, just a beginning. We have uh, a team which is uh, in charge of the open source development at the uh, IT department. So it's not an official OSPO, but we have um, a deputy mayor which is very enthusiastic uh, and uh, uh, who is uh, enthusiastic and who support us and um, is um, uh, very, very helpful. This is very, very helpful. Uh, so uh, we now are very excited uh, to read about the OFE study that recommended the European, the European Commission to help build 20 public sector OSPOs. This would bring uh, other municipalities to the table, work together and uh, help in workshops and share the risks. Uh, no, without a doubt, uh, an OSPO would um, benefit Paris and make uh, our work more visible and um, the teams easier to reach, help us co-work and find common needs to co-implement. It would also be a way to make sure uh, the city OS policy is implemented and help spread the OS, OS culture and best practice internally as well as uh, externally. If you have to, if we have two minutes, uh, we would like to highlight the fact that open source applies to uh, very important goals that are linked but are not quite the same. And uh, maybe the OSPO um, can help us to, to solve the main issue, uh, which is how to share between administrations. Because the publication um, that brings transparency, sovereignty and trust between administration and citizens, as well as uh, cost savings and uh, public, uh, the principle of public money, public good, is um, maybe easy to, to develop and to set up. But sharing uh, uh, between administration is, um, I think it's more, uh, more difficult and it's a struggle uh, to, to figure out how to share a roadmap with our other entities and um, still deliver services engaged by our elected officials. So we have to manage two, two different works to, to deliver services and to share uh, our developments with other administrations. It's very important to um, uh, consider the need to set up, uh, to set up legal facilities to help us to better mutual, mutualize experiences at the national and the European and broader level. Uh, the bigger our community grows, the less we internally uh, can handle all the support. So the development of open source to be shared requires uh, legal openness with the possibility of having entities that allow and facilitate procurement co-developments and manage the community to ideally uh, reach that level where the community is self-sufficient. Uh, there is a great need for such an entity uh, that can manage, take over the roadmap, the definitions of common needs, uh, of open standards, etc. And it's not uh, so easy to build in the public sector. So we are trying now with uh, two or three other cities in France uh, and I think that our, uh, our an OSPO will help us to to reach the, this goal. Thank you, Neja. And so what I'm hearing is that like an OSPO, in many respects, is, is essential to helping support and scale the activities you're doing internally in terms of good guidance and, and legal practices for the organization itself. It's pretty obvious that it can have a huge role in actually smoothing collaborations between organizations, which is really, really important. But it also sounds that from a per public sector perspective, it is a very much evolving concept in this in the um, 
in the in the way that it is actually helping define how these collaborations actually are going to happen um, and to, to smooth those collaborations as they go. And even as, as Saeed was talking about how they can actually be extended to incorporate the idea of creating or skills programs or education or incorporating more participants in the whole open source community. So Roberto, can I come back to you for a minute and just ask you, how do you see these evolving in the future? What other areas could OSPOs look at from a public sector perspective that perhaps we haven't mentioned so far? Or where is your vision on that? Well, thanks, Claire, to, to give me a second occasion to uh, occupy your time. So then, yes, there are other areas where it is actually important to have a single phone number where that you need to call. And one of these, I would like to draw the attention of everybody here, is actually what happens in open science. You, we have been going through an incredible crisis due to this virus, which is still, uh, still bugging most of us. And we have learned, I mean, I hope when I say we, I say the humankind, I believe all the people listening to this particular uh, uh, presentation already knew, we have learned that the best way to face difficulty versus big crisis is actually by sharing knowledge and collaboration. And to do so this effectively, then you need to share the result of your research, giving credit, of course. I mean, credit is the full in academic, fundamental. Don't steal the work of other, use it and say thanks. But then you need to actually be able to share everything you do. This means the articles, this means the data. I mean, that was a core of this uh, 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 Rail report. And you need to share also the software we are building, the software you are using, software you are integrating, software you are evolving. This in the academic sector is something that we have been doing unbeknownst to, to ourselves, I mean, without even realizing for a long time. Now we need to do it on purpose, clearly. And it is not so easy as you can believe. So not everybody in academia is pro open source. It depends on the field, depends on the discipline. And not every sector in a university or research institution is actually favorable to share software. They believe there is some intellectual property they can sell, right? Uh, usually people that think this never actually developed a, 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 a real software project and never understood the big difference between an academic prototype and an engineered uh, industry product. Right? There is a huge difference. You cannot just sell it like a typical patent on, 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 uh, on, a, on a medicine. Okay, It's very different. But so we need a place in our institution. I'm so happy to see that Said started this work. Uh, so I'm kind of jealous. We should have started before you, since we are so advanced in science. But uh, really, hard tip for what you're doing. Uh, we need a place. We're actually in academia, in the research institution, in the organization. You have people in charge of providing the researchers expertise they do not have the time to build, uh, uh, to strategy, education, and support, and the, again, consistent policy position of the institution. It cannot change every time you change a director. Otherwise, that's not the strategy. Okay, It's, it's just contingency. And we cannot work that way. So this is another area where this is, would be important. You know, for example, this open science movement that started a few years ago, now it got momentum. So I do not know what happens in the States, but for example, in Europe, we see vice president for open science or pro-rector for open science, as title all over the place in our university. Why don't we have a pro-rector or vice president for open source? Not just for IT or for digital education, that's too vague and too, too, too I mean, too, too fuzzy. But just for open source, taking into account the software that we use, the software that we produce, the software that we study. Because when you look at what happens in academia, actually software is a multifaceted object. It can be a tool that you are using to produce a result or just to, to enter the grade of your students. I mean, I mean, can, it's just a tool. Or it can be a product of a research, it is a result of a research effort. Or it can be an object of study. You look at how the software has been developed. Actually, this can be the three things depending on who is looking at it. Okay, So we need to, to have a place where people understand this complexity, network together. So that's the reason I like this idea of network of possible. Try to build and share together best practices. And let me just say, 
do not expect too much from hospitals, okay? It depends on the expertise you put in there. And remember that public administration is not the same as a private company. So what works in a private company does not necessarily translate equally to a public administration or to a research institution. Okay? There are differences that you need to, 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 to recognize and maintain. But this is another area where I do believe uh, having this kind of hospitals is really uh, important by doing it let's say humbly but consistently and together thank you thank you roberto and I, I think that point about the fact that in public sector every ospo may be different that's certainly what we have come across in our work that depending on the priorities of the organization the context they're working in the the functions they want to provide may be different and as we're hearing today are actually evolving in real time so we're a little bit over time on the panel so i'm just going to go to saeed for one last comment perhaps very briefly saeed about where you see the future of ospos uh, going So I think we've heard a lot of interesting ideas about interoperability and cooperation. Um, I, I remember saying some time ago that technology interoperability is hard, uh, human interoperability is harder, and organizational interoperability is even harder than that. Uh, and it, from the information science community, we have this expression of making the implicit explicit. And I think what OSPOs can help with is making the implicit more explicit uh, and coming up with patterns. So as Roberto and others have pointed out, you, you have these case studies, this is really what we're talking about here, where specific individuals came together. They're leveraging institutional or organizational resources, of course, but it's individuals driving it. We want that to become a pattern or a model that other people can adopt and can use more readily. And I think this network of OSPOs is really the way to make that happen. And, and the final point I'll make is, really important to keep in mind. This is not about OSPOs, universities, even the public sector saying to the citizens here, we're helping you. Fundamentally, it's about the citizens helping themselves. It's about engaging them so that it's a partnership in terms of addressing their needs and problems and not a one-way arrow or exchange. Thank you, Saeed. That's a, it's great to think about how OSPOs can empower citizen um, engagement in that respect. Um, and Neja, I think just as a final note, um, I believe uh, that you have an interesting announcement to make in terms of the plans for next the end of this year. So perhaps you can share with us uh, your plans in respect to the uh, Open Source Forum, City Forum. Neja? Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I think I, there because I, I told you that I have to leave because I have oh, another meeting. Sorry. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, we, we, I can uh, let Philippe answer. Yes, certainly. And, uh, thank, and you thank you. Thank you, Neja. And thank you for joining us here today. Sorry. We did run a little bit over, so apologies about that. Um, so, Philippe, if you're in the chat, perhaps you can you can add the, the news in terms of what Paris is planning for November in, in the chat. And at this point in time, I'd like to thank Neja, who had to run off very quickly, um, and Roberto and Saeed. Thank you so much for joining us on this first panel. We really appreciate it. And while thank we you. say goodbye to Saeed and Roberto, I will ask Mala and Maurizio to perhaps join us now for our second panel for today's event. Um, oh, Philippe is here. So maybe, maybe, Philippe, you can very briefly tell us the news in terms of Paris in November then. Oh no, we're having sound issues from my can side. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, thank you for bringing me on stage. Uh, yes, of course, that we have a big announcement to make. Um, well, we have to wait until we know that traveling is allowed later this year uh, because, uh, as you may know, we uh, organized uh, in June 2, 2019 uh, our first uh, Open Source City Forum. Um, and many actors among which uh, the OW2 consortium, uh, by the way, which helps us a lot with her with their blueprints uh, for building OSPOs and will soon be uh, real, uh, will soon rely on these uh, rules uh, at the seat of Paris. There was the Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, Mouse Labs was there. Everyone brought their experience and offered uh, their help to see Paris somehow take the lead in the municipal space uh, in and in open source. So I'm very happy to announce that hopefully this year, um, associated to this year's Paris open source experience in November, we'll organize a reunion of such a, an event. And hopefully you will all know soon about that. 
Well, fingers crossed. Thank you, Philippe, for sharing that. And fingers crossed we can all Thank join you, you in Paris in November. There's been nothing I'd Thank like you. more. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like Thank you. And um, at this point, then, I would like to invite on the stage, our virtual stage, uh, Mala and Maurizio for our second panel of the day. Um, hello, Maurizio, and uh, um, hopefully Mala will join us soon. But um, let me introduce our new panelists here. And uh, again, feel free to wave, though it's, I think it may be more obvious this time who's who. Um, but uh, Mala is a UX researcher and designer uh, who's leading Tech for Social Good program at GitHub, uh, but has worked on many different social good projects in the private sector in the United Nations and in nonprofits over the years. So welcome, Mala. Um, and Maurizio Gazzola is the Chief Strategic Solutions in the United Nations uh, in the Office of Information and Telecommunications Technology. And he and his office have been working on innovation programs aiming at assisting United Nations member states with the support in their tech adoption. So very big welcome to both of you here today, and thank you for joining us. Um, and I guess one of the things, you know, we've heard a lot in the previous panel about how open source and open source program offices can help cities and universities in terms of their adoption of open source uh, uh, programs. But right at the very end, we were talking a little bit more about the network effect. And I think what we'd like to explore in this panel is really the opportunity that open source program offices might have to uh, to really, I suppose, make an impact on a global scale in, 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 in the world, I guess. So um, Mala, perhaps I'm gonna start for with you and just if you can tell us from your experience how you think open source and in particular open source program offices might help the social sector um yeah sure can everybody hear me okay we can right um yeah so my name is mala i lead the tech for social good program on the github social impact team but before i joined github a couple of years ago i spent the better part of a decade um, in the united nations system and then with other international development organizations basically designing and deploying tech products throughout the world um, and one thing I think that kind of became very apparent in my first few days at GitHub is that although entities like, you know, different organizations within the United Nations system, for instance, are becoming tech service providers, they don't necessarily see themselves that way. Um, so anybody who's worked in international development knows this common story where you're a design team of one and you have, you know, if you're lucky, maybe 10% of an engineer's time who's splitting their time over 10 countries, right? <laughs> it's not easy to build tech products in these, in these big, massive bureaucracies because, as we know, tech is a really important part of solution building for the social sector and making the world a more just and fair place, but it's not the core of it, right? And so these organization structures really reflect that. And one of the great things I think about the way that many OSPOs have been set up, especially through Microsoft and Sun, Sun Microsystems and all of, all of these private sector tech companies is that it's not really a centralization effort, but it's really a capacity building for the organization itself. So I'd love to see that same idea applied across the board. Like if I had been at the UN and I had a go-to design team that could help me not tell me when I, I'm supposed to build something because that's my job to determine what is be, being built and when, but really to help my capacity so that they can answer common questions and I get how we talk about reducing friction. So helping me in the case of an OSPO with which open source license I'm supposed to be using or what are some of the other projects or organizations that might have taken a similar approach that I can build off of. Really augmenting that capacity I think is quite fundamental to some of these organizations. So it's building up a lot of efforts we've seen in the UN system. So, I mean, obviously Mauricio is at the forefront of one of them. We are too at GitHub, we're working directly with the World Health Organization, which is a specialized agency of the UN to look at how an OSPO might be rolled out. There's been a lot of initiatives to kind of sensitize this concept of open source, which is obviously very important, but we're now getting to the point where we have to get past just the idea that open source is important and more to the details of how it could work in these massive bureaucracies, let's be honest. Yeah, and, 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 and thank you for that, because I think that that seems to be the bigger challenge. Now, before I come to you, Maurizio, I'm just going to note that you, that whatever way my screen is happening here, I can only see half your face. So you might just, uh, there, thank you very much. And now we can see the whole one for you. So thank you very much. Um, but um, I'd like to come to you now. So from the United Nations perspective, um, thinking about the big challenges that we all have to face um, as, uh, as nation states, as individuals, um, can you maybe share with us a little bit about how you are working on the sustainable development goals and how that relates to open source and your view of OSPOs as well. 
Thank you, Claire, for, for having me on, on this panel. I think in, so far it's a very interesting discussion and um, we are obviously looking uh, from, from a wider perspective and as you know, and I believe everybody uh, participates to, to this uh, webinar knows about the Sustainable Development Goals. It's probably one of the best products that UN has been uh, you know, put together in the last uh, several years. And obviously the 17 goals are designed to fight hunger, poverty, ensure the equality and dignity for, for all. So this is a very big macro uh, dimension of the whole problem and the general assembly said though that we are it's not only governments that have to achieve these these uh, um, sdgs it's a responsibility of everybody so i believe that from from our perspective and from a technology pers perspective we've been working a lot on with with, with the, anybody who wants to help us and and uh, the open source approach of uh, working together is has been something that has uh, is been found out to be a very great have a great potential to accelerate the reach of the agenda 2030 which is where the sustainability uh, the sustainable development goal should be should be um, uh, achieved so from from OICT from my office of uh, information and communication technology we are basically serving around 100,000 uh, UN staff uh, in in more than 980 countries so we are working on or both sides, you know, making sure that the, the organization is, is up and running and that the, the staff member have the tools to work with the, with technology. But also we are really engaging on, on, uh, on ensuring that we are providing support to member states in the achievement of the, of the sustainable development goals. Our, our motto and our, our you know, main objective is really to make technology inclusive. And uh, we've been working uh, through open source in, in various initiatives, including uh, a crowdsource, crowdsourcing um, platform to search for ideas and, and uh, from the community, over 25,000 people or, or, or citizens that are engaged in our community. And uh, we have actually worked on and received one of the uh, uh, solutions for more than 30 challenges that start, started from, you know, service security to circular economy to uh, making sure that we have, uh, you know, a model for electrification of, uh, of countries in, in, in Africa and, and so on. So that has been a very good, you know, uh, support to engaging and making sure that we're working uh, inclusively with everybody. We also run uh, um, what we call the Re Reboot Accelerator program, which is really started with the Reboot Earth concept. Then we went into Reboot the Ocean, and Reboot the Health, Health Being, and there's been our you know, um, brand over there, but we have engaged in several countries around the world with local communities, local technology e ecosystems, including private sector uh, startups, to make sure that we come up with solutions that can be resolving or addressing some of these problems. So again, also there, we had more than uh, 200 uh, participants participant in our event in, in, in Delhi in India. So this was in, incredibly, and it was two days. Uh, people worked 24 hours a day for two days and produced incredible stuff. Um, another initiative we worked on was the Technology Innovation Labs, making sure that we have presence in these countries to engage with the local ecosystem, the academia, the private sector, and making sure that we're working through an open source uh, approach. So all these three initiatives I just mentioned really demonstrate the power of engagement, engaging uh, open source community, and, and also the strength that the organization like ours can derive from, from these uh, engagement uh, citizens uh, with citizens worldwide. So we are at the early stages of establishing our OSPO. Hmm. And uh, we have been uh, trying to, to, to map through a, a strategy that is 90% there. So hopefully we're gonna, it's gonna be announced soon to enable streamline the or, uh, organized open source for what works within the UN, but also ties the, the OSPO into the UN long-term mandates uh, and making sure that we also work with uh, different entities uh, uh, um, that already have gone through the path of establishing an OSPO. And, you know, we're working with the with the Digit uh, in, in the EU and also John Hopkins. I think the next uh, meeting we have, we say, yeah, is really to talk about the, the, the six months uh, of code. So that's also something that we're going to work together very, very clearly. So in, in essence, uh, we are really engaging into this and uh, we see See the, the the power of the of the open source, and we are ready to to move it forward to the next step. 
Well, uh, again, it's it's wonderful to hear that the the work that the United Nations is doing and the potential around open source there. And obviously, once again, you've been doing a lot of the functions we talked about here that could be incorporated within an OSPO. But as as Roberto mentioned earlier, uh, it sounds like now there's going to be a phone number we can ring when we want to collaborate on that. And I, I think in, in the prep, actually, Mala, we were talking about how this has a potential to actually increase the diversity and inclusion of the participants at a global scale in the open source community in terms of engaging people on, on the issues that are going to impact the most. So perhaps you can comment on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, this is something I tell my colleagues at GitHub all the time. So, you know, the UN is comprised of many different organizations. We've got specialized funds and programs and agencies that all kind of have a different mandate area, uh, you know, often according to the SDGs. So World Health Organization, obviously, is SDG3, which is Global Health and Wellbeing. We've got UNICEF, whose mandate is largely education and the health of uh, mothers of young children and young children themselves. So they have very different areas that they work on. They all have offices globally. And one of the things that's interesting is that if you look at especially countries that have a lower tech maturity and you know are low and middle income countries, one of the biggest employers of developers of technology technologists in these countries is the UN system, is these multinational organizations like the World Bank or the UN agencies. And so if we do anything, and I'm really glad that to see the this concept note that has come out, kind of talking about the economic impact of an OSPO, because imagine if a UN agency that is a major employer of African developers, for instance, creates an OSPO that would, in theory, increase demand and just under, like, make the concept more visible. Um, one of the things that we hear about all the time, because we, we did do this very large research project and, and published a report last year called Open Source Software in the Social Sector, and that was based on um, many, many interviews, many surveying, a lot of information and still one of the more comprehensive resources at that intersection. But one of the things that we heard in that process was that African developers cons consistently tell us that there's really no path of becoming an open source expert to employment. Now, there are exceptions, obviously, like Nigeria, South Africa, countries that have you know, a more mature tech ecosystem, uh, obviously have more uh, mature open source ecosystems. But in rare instances, do you see that happen? And so for those of us here in the States or in Europe, where we have a lot of lag time, we can kind of build our personal brand, we can get involved in projects that we really like and just kind of explore different ways of becoming technologists. That's not necessarily the case if you have lower, even you know, fewer social safety nets than we do here in the States, if you don't have as many employment opportunities as, as we do here. Um, and so even if we were able to double the number of open source, you know, jobs from five to 10 in a country, that's a step forward. I'm not saying that it's at scale just yet, but these are the kinds of movements that we need to make because there is a critical part that the UN and again, these other multinational organizations play in the employment I guess, opportunities of open source in some of these countries. No, thank you. And, and and you can see the real opportunity there. So even for a country like Ireland, uh, where I come from, um, thinking about the fact that right now, although there may be spare time to actually do these things, the discoverability of the projects that would inspire younger people or people who might be new to this kind of concept to actually get engaged in the open source community, um, that might be a little bit lower than it might be uh, with the actual introduction of a, an OSPO whose role it is to actually promote the open source uh, projects that are going to change the world that we live in. And and help address the biggest problems we face. So, so that's very inspiring, and, and I, I really want to, to commend uh, the United Nations, and thank you for those comments, uh, Mala, in terms of what the opportunity is there. So uh, we're, we're, we're coming close to the end of this panel session, but Maurizio, perhaps you could actually just share with us, uh, just in terms of your plans to actually drive the adoption of open source through your OSPO that is emerging um, in member states. Like, what, what are you planning to do in order to be able to encourage more participation and to ease that participation. Uh, thank you, Claire. I, I mean, at, in the UN, we're still at the ERO stage, as uh, you know, we were hearing before. So on on the OSPO side, so we are really at the uh, the concept is still nascent, but we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, kind of strategized with our colleagues and our friends, and we we come up with a kind of three tier approach. Um, the first approach is where we have the most kind of uh, uh, influence on and uh, basically within our office of information communication technology basically basically touching on policy and actual implementation of the principles that an OSPO is uh, is uh, set to to support and basically we really want to walk the talk and uh, we make to make sure that you know that the software that we provide um, is is uh, you know open and is uh, there's a mind shift and uh, whereby the organization can operate on in a transparent inclusive and open way and so like like digit in in the in the EU and the commission we are trying to 
change the internal culture from a bottom-up approach. And we have selected a few concrete pro projects. As you know, you know, particularly in my office, we've been use, supporting member states by providing centralized solutions that they can install in their jurisdictions and work through um, um, their, their duties of serving their citizens, particularly on, on all the mandates that UN is providing against uh, counterterrorism. And uh, the last project that we, 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 sh we shared with, the, with the Afghanistan is, is a full land registry solution for Afghanistan occupancy certificates that is installed in Afghanistan and we are ready to uh, open source it and get contribution from additional uh, you know, people around the world and, and, and our uh, academia and, and private sector to make sure that we we construct, construct and customize and configurable and make it configurable, make the tool configurable so that other countries could um, adopt that particular solution, which is uh, blockchain enabled. So it's got emerging technology and that has been a bit our, our work. So selecting specific projects where we can start building the community, also learn ourselves how to manage the community, how to make sure that we are, we are providing um, uh, value added and we again value added in with with engaging uh, with with many many uh, experts out there. At the second tier, we really want to, as Mala was saying, the UN has a lot of organization, a lot of verticals uh, on specific SDGs. So we need to make sure that uh, policy coordination is happening. So we really have started to work uh, with some UN entities who are planning or started discussing uh, the heroes. We have heroes in in every uh, you know UN entity. So we want to uh, rob them in and make sure that we are working on a on a policy coordination approach uh, with, with the UN family. But also the third uh, layer is, is probably one of the most um, you know, ambitious, but, but very important is really to start working with member states and uh, making sure that we maybe we come up with a with a discussion uh, uh, that would lead to maybe a, a resolution on an open or on open source that would you know bound, bind you know all all member states of the UN and actually from our side we would be able to to support them in in a, through capacity building and raising the the open source profile and maybe having OSPOS established and supported by by the UN and connected through the UN network uh, in uh, um, in, in uh, world wide so this three approach is really to try to bring all the resources together bring build strong expertise establish open source community connection and connectivity between the networks of, of the OSPO that hopefully will be uh, spawning spawning you know around around the world so at present we are really working on the OICT OSPO and we are um, looking to work with the, with the um, colleagues from other entities but our main goal is to try to see if a group of friends of uh, open source could be established, maybe in New York through the permanent missions in New York, and uh, the work uh, and the heroes that we we see in, in capitals as well, and start really the discussion at UN level and to uh, uh, around open source and and the adoption of, of open source. So that these are the three things that we're trying to to put together and and work on from uh, as of now. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll all be interested in that. Um, I see I see one of the questions in in the in the thread there was about whether or not Ireland was considering an OSPO, and I I think one of the things I'd like to share is that in our experiences, uh, like we've discussed many times here today, um, oftentimes countries are are performing some of the functions that an OSPO in public sector might might actually do, um, and part of the journey that we have here is be, is being able to identify who is doing what today, who are the heroes who are involved, and take the patterns that uh, Maurizio just talked about in terms of actually sharing those and as we do that activity um, we can move further towards formalizing a, an OSPO and, and I'm delighted to hear that there is a focus from the global organizations and, and organization and you know like the EU as well in terms of actually supporting the formal uh, um, creation and, uh, and, and networking indeed of, of the OSPOs uh, across the world so um, we're coming up to the unfortunately we've run out of time and um, we always do it seems like a conversation that could go on and on um, but I really want to thank you Maurizio thank you Mala for joining us to hear about the potential at that global level uh, for open source and for OSPOs to help uh, scale those connect connections and networks and um, so without further ado I'd like to invite back Aster perhaps to uh, to close the event but to thank you both and to thank Aster indeed for inviting me here today to help uh, facilitate this panel um, and to wish you all a happy Easter um, thank you very much okay thank you very much Claire 
Yeah, I've uh, yeah, I was asked to just close the, the event and just round off. So I'll do this super quick because I at least here in Europe it's uh, uh, getting a bit late. But I think it's been very interesting. I've been taking a lot of notes. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of discussions for each individual organization university or government institution to really work on the internal open source culture and identify those heroes and build this structure. But I really want to to make the case for, for um, uh, open source being this established um, uh, way of collaborating across diverse organizations based on tried and tested licenses and norms. Um, and they are, have produced vast amounts of value, value in the trillions uh, uh, over the last, few, you know, decade, decades. And uh, uh, in some ways, while there's of course a lot of other actions that are important uh, that can be done and are already being done, I think uh, uh, the OSPO and talking about OSPOs in these global networks uh, is really a government or a university's tool or perhaps gateway to all of this value for for their citizens. So yeah, um, uh, yeah. In our view, of course, uh, the recommendation that I put forward in the beginning is that I believe that the EU and the European Commission has a very, uh, uh, you know, a great opportunity here to to play play a role in kickstarting uh, such a, such a network. Of course, together with uh, organizations such as the UN, but also. Uh, you know, from those big organizations to the individual developers and and uh, um, people working hard out there in many different organizations to to increase collaboration uh, around open source, because I believe um, that such a, an established network looking to the future, like Maurizio did, this in turn can support us in bringing uh, you know open source policies uh, uh, that can solve the the really great and grand global challenges at scale that we can really through these networks uh, uh, achieve um, uh, uh, the solutions that we need. Well, so with that, I'll say that uh, we will, of course, uh, share the recording with everyone and uh, interesting links and things from the chat. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, considering Philippe's invitation uh, earlier, uh, perhaps we'll see each other in no uh, November in Paris. I think that would be uh, very, very nice. It's time for me to take that one hour trip from Brussels, I think. Well, with that, uh, I hope you'll have a very nice evening or whatever time uh, it is where you're calling in from. And uh, I hope to see you soon at the other uh, OFE policy series events coming up. Bye, everyone.